praise the Lord. They tell us that this is Super Bowl Sunday. You know, in Super Bowl Sunday, there's a team that wins and there's a team that loses. I am glad that this is Super Soul Sunday, where we will always be victorious in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. Turn with me in your Bibles. Aren't you excited you came to church today? What a privilege it is to be here. Pastor Leslie, thank you for hosting me. Pastor Randy, thank you for inviting me. He has asked me to speak on something that's very, very pertinent today. It's right, NASA is telling us that there's going to be four blood red moons coming in the next two years. Now, again, most of the church doesn't know a whole lot about that. So I've got to take you through a little bit of a teaching today before I preach to you. But turn with me to Psalm, excuse me, to John 7. And this is what I'll be eventually preaching about today. Psalm 7. Excuse me, I don't know why I'm saying Psalm. John 7, verse 37 and 38. Now, let me title this for you today. And we, you've, uh, you already know the title because if you were here last week, this is actually part two. I'm going to put this up on the screen, show you John chapter 7. If we got that up on the screen for us, guys. And we'll see what we got. John 7, listen to what it says. You can leave that there. Hello. Just leave that back up on there. All right, there we go. The title of my message is Signs, Seasons, and Times, Part 2, The Age of Aquarius. Now, I know it doesn't fit, seem to fit in a church setting, but trust me, it does. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, for your intelligent design. I thank you, Lord God, that everything that we see was designed by you, Lord God. I'm thankful, Lord God, that man made a little lower than the angels will rise above one day, Lord God. I am thankful, Lord God, for your handiwork. I am thankful for the heavens, O oh God, and for your stopwatch that you have in the stars, a precise timing, an ordered course, Lord God. I'm thankful that there's a beginning and an end. I'm thankful you that there is an alpha and the omega. I am thankful that there is a God who cares about me, who has given me breath and life, and Lord will not leave me to die in a grave someday, but will resurrect me along with the saints and take me to live with him forever. Lord, I am thankful today that you have a plan and a purpose, a destiny for every single one that is here. Today, Lord God, help us in our quest to find you more. Help us, oh God, to understand your great handiwork. Lord, be with this church today, Lord God. Be with the speaker, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to tell you that what we've been talking about, and again, if, you've been, if you're here and you didn't come last week, that's okay. Our tape sales will go up. But let me tell you, I will, I will bring you up to snuff real quick. NASA is telling us that there's going to be four blood red moons. Now, listen, why does that matter to you? Because the Bible says about the signs of the times, it says in Joel that the moon will turn to blood and the sun will be darkened. It also says that in Acts, in the last day, the moon will turn to blood and the sun will be darkened. Well, is that a big thing? Well, let me show you a little bit. Without having to re-preach yet last week, we know that in Passover, April 15th, coming up, 2014, the Feast of Passover, a blood red moon is going to happen. We know in uh, Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, October 8, 2014, a blood red moon. Nisan 1st, March, a religious new year for the Jews, a total solar eclipse. Then we also know that the next Passover, April 4, 2015, a blood red moon. We know September 28th, my birthday, uh, 2015, you can buy, it's not too early to get me a present. Um, 2015 is the Peace, Feast of Passover, excuse me, Tabernacles, another blood red moon. And we also have a, a partial uh, solar eclipse in the secular new year. Now, why does that matter? What, is it, what does that mean? Well, I want to give you just a brief, a brief study of that that I did last week so in case you missed it. It's not rare to have a red moon, which we'll show you in a moment, illustrate to you. It is extremely rare to have blood red moons back to back on feast days of Israel. We have only had seven of them since 1 AD. And so these blood red moons will happen in your sky and in my sky. God is waking up Israel. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. The Bible tells us, and you can put that next, that next uh, chart up. I think I can, change, uh, I can hit it for you. But the next chart tells you why God put those stars up there in the first place. Uh, look what it says. It says, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. We, saw, we read that one. But basically what I wanted to read to you was this one. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So the signs that God has given us, there's many signs. We don't need another sign to herald us to the Lord coming back. Somebody say amen. amen. But there are signs in the sky. God has used the signs in the sky down through the ages. That's one of the reasons why the, why the Magi went to follow Christ, because they looked at a signs in the sky. We know that Jesus talks about the Pharisees, how they know how to discern the, the seasons by the, discern the night sky, but they don't know how to, how to read his second coming. So we know that 
that those signs mean something to us. Now, before you get way off base and think that I'm trying to teach astrology or astronomy, I am not. I am proving the handiwork of God. I want you to see that today. I want you to understand what's going on. God, Jehovah, is married to Israel. Christ is married to the church. If we believe we're living in the last days, Jesus is going to come back, 2 Thessalonians tells us. There's going to be a trumpet shout. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up so forever to be with the Lord in the air. And when that happens, you're going to see Israel start to be, start to be wooed back to, to Jehovah because God is going to bring a national salvation. 144,000 Israeli Jews, male virgins, are going to lead a national revival. Why? Because God is, Jesus is married to the church and God is, Jehovah is married to Israel. He loves her just like Hosea would go out after a wandering wife. God is going to start turning his focus to Israel. He's already doing it with lots of signs. He's already doing it with, with preachers that, rabbis that are turning like Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri and talking about the Messiah being Jesus. Unheard of before. So we are watching the signs and the times. And then I want to bring you someplace that seems like it doesn't relate at all. And this is the next thing. This I want you to play. Oh man, brings me back to my hippie days. I actually want to dance. But I won't. Now if you're under 40, you don't know this song, but keep running. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planets and love We'll steer the stars. All right, stop before we get into that mind spirit. <laughs> now, why did I bring that to you? Well, the fifth dimension pictured here was a group in the late 60s. Uh, they would be your equivalent of a Justin Bieber or, or a uh, One Direction today. Maybe not as famous, but they were, the, they were run it, running up the charts. They had a number, that was a number one song. And when I listened to it when I was young, I thought, well, it's, it's all right, it's a good song, but... Only older, when I, when I was older, when I started studying the Word of God, by the way, that I started to realize what was going on here. I want you to see that last week we talked about the moon, the sun, the stars, the signs from God in light of those four coming blood red moons of 2014 and 15. I also showed you that these verses uh, talk about the 12 constellations. And let me remind you again, I am going to your Bible and to mine so that you can understand that. So let me show you one of the verses I told you. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, that's the outer rim that you can see in the earth, shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. Something's happening in the night sky that the Bible says way back in Psalms is showing knowledge. It says there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line, and it actually means a circular path. This was written 1045 B.C., long before anybody thought the world was around. But their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words, notice it says words, to the end of the world. In them has he, God, set a tabernacle for the sun. It later tells you that that sun progresses through the, those tabernacles and comes as a, as a bridegroom out of a bride chamber. I also showed you this verse in the oldest book of the Bible chronologically, Job. God is questioning Job. He says, can you bind the sweet influences of Pallades? Pallades is the seven sisters, seven stars, also known as Cassiopeia in the night sky, or loose the bands of Orion, one of the most visible uh, of the constellations, the uh, Orion's belt. God's questioning Job. Can you bring forth Maseroth in his season? And this is where most people get messed up. They think the zodiac was invented by the enemy, that it was astrology. It was not. He stole it. Let me tell you why. Maseroth is the 12 constellations. God is telling Job, can you bring the 12 constellations around? Can you do the, can you make the move, or you can guide, or can you guide Arcturus? That is the northern bear or Polaris, or you know it as the Big Dipper. God's saying to Job, listen, I have created those things. He's actually naming them. These are the oldest names of any star, anything we have. The stars are extremely old. We have their names that have been passed down for millennium. And he's saying, can you guide all this? This is way before mythology. It's way before the Greeks and the Romans put gods to these stars. It's God questioning Job. I pointed you to the story of the stars and how they are not about us. You don't have a horoscope, by the way. And they're about Jesus, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, the Virgin, Virgo the Virgin. I showed you that last week. There are signs associated with Jesus' first coming. All those signs, as they progress across the sky, 
are a prophecy of Christ. Of Christ. Then we see the middle ones. They're ones we're living in. Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and Aries. Aries is actually the lamb. And we see the signs associated with the church age. And then we have Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. Leo the lion are associated with Jesus' second coming. Notice, it starts with a virgin. Uh, she, I'll show you her in a moment. It ends with Leo the lion. This is the progression of the stars. Almost every civilization on planet Earth has worshipped the stars. They've not worshipped Christ. They've worshipped this warped message that has been in the stars. That doesn't delineate from the fact that God has put them there as a sign and as a message to all of us. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I pointed you to these. We don't have time to fully explain them all. I'll explain some of it today for you as I teach before I preach. But look at this one specifically. This one is another one of the 12 constellations called Aquarius. Now notice it's been depicted like this as some man, and he's changed over the years, by the way, as some man, some god, some demigod that is pouring out something from, from a water pot, a big water jug. As a matter of fact, if you saw the whole constellation, it's actually going into a river. And so this has been there for millennia again. Now, what does it mean? Not astronomically today, but, but um, spiritually. Well, those stars and their meanings are the creative work of an amazing God. Come on, somebody say amen. We take them for granted. You very rarely does somebody go outside and say, hey, look at that star cluster, and this is what it means. You couldn't point out that if you, in a million years if I took you outside. Somebody had to show that this was somebody pouring water out. We know there was no Bible in Abraham's day. We know that God took him out to count the stars. Come on, how many of you know this? We know there's a message in those stars. We know that Babel, once Babel happened, once the world was flooded, we know that that great canopy broke. It had never rained on the planet. That canopy acted like a great magnifier. And the stars that seemed so close, that story seemed so close because of the evil of men shot away. And now we know that those, the evil, had, evil uh, generations had gathered in the plains and they had tried to build Babel to understand God. We know there's something mysterious about it. We know there's something out there and if you do any study as I have, you'll find that there's a whole lot more than what you think about when you look at the night sky. The complexity of their story has mostly been lost or transferred to mystical and mythical images. Everyone, not that, it, not that I want to get more complex on you, but every one of those 12 those 12 constellations, and again, just follow me. You don't have to remember all this. But every one of those 12 constellations has three minor constellations under it, which also tell the story of Christ. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of them. I don't have time to show you all of them. But underneath Aquarius, there is this one. This is Pegasus. He's the, Pegasus is a white horse. If you know your Bible, you will know that Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse. Come on, somebody say amen. It's been a white horse forever. Let me tell you, mythology has added wings to it, but the original sign doesn't have wings. It is right next to, to our, our uh, constellation Aquarius. Now again, hang on. Lots of information. I promise you, I will bring it around. Then we have this one, which is Pegasus. Pegasus, or Pe uh, uh, Cygnus. Cygnus is called the swan, but you will notice that there is something peculiar about this swan. It has a cross in the middle of it. It's also known as the Northern Cross. There are many signs and stars of crosses, serpents, conquerors, victors. It all points to Christ. Lambs, scapegoats, all points to fish, which is a symbolic of, of Christ himself. Look, Satan has warped these messages. He's warped these stars. He's warped these constellations. Look at John 10.10 10 as we go there. This is what, the, what Satan has come. The thief comes not but for to steal. Everybody say steal. steal. To kill and destroy. But I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Now, you're following me so far, so let's just continue. Man, Satan loves to steal. Amen. Somebody say amen. He is the cosmic thief. He stole the serpent that God created and used him to tempt Eve. That serpent was a, was a walking creature at one time, and we don't have time to develop it, a speaking creature creature at one time. It was commanded to be from the curse to eat dust. If you eat dust, your vocal cords are gone. But, but God created that serpent around that tree of knowledge. And Satan stole that serpent's body to confuse Eve. We know he's the great cosmic thief. Listen, he, is, he stole God's word right out of Eve's ears. Listen to what he says. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the gardens? Satan stole the words right out of Eve's ears. Listen, today you will hear a message from God. By the time you're out of these doors, the enemy will try to steal that word from your hearts. He is constantly trying to take the word right out of your heart, right out of your ears. Come on, how many are with me today? And so we know that he's this cosmic thief, this, this, this great kleptomaniac of the cosmos. He steals everything he possibly can. 
He stole man's innocence in a garden. He stole man's life when Cain murdered Abel. He even stole music that was intended to be used for praise and worship to Jehovah. He stole that, and let me show you who he gave it to. As he stole that music, listen to it. And his brother's name was Jubal. This is evil Cain's lineage. This is Lamech as his father. He was the father of all such that handle harp and organ. You may know that name. We get the word jubilation or jubilee from it. It means to make praise with the sound of instruments. Satan stole music, and you know where music has gone today. Come on, somebody say amen. He steals power and signs and wonders that God intends to give to his saints. Let me chain you through scripture. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, you'll notice I'm giving you scripture today, not my opinion. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist will come and listen, he will be healed of a deadly wound. There will be an image that will be worshipped every, by everyone. He will have lying signs and wonders. The entire world will think he's the Christ. The Muslims will think he's the, he's the lost imam. You will have the, the Jews who are secular will think he's actually the Messiah. I, I dare to say some Christians who are, who are not really who are not really following God may actually claim and think that he is the Messiah the whole world is going to be captured by this man he is a false Christ he has with him a false God the great red dragon that is a false God the father he has a false Holy Spirit we know that there's a lying prophet that comes up the false prophet this is an unholy Trinity Satan loves to steal things today he will steal anything he can but he's not original he's stealing things from God come on somebody say amen and he's trying to steal from you and from me right now as you're sitting here. He's trying to steal your happiness, your health, and your hope. He's trying to steal your dreams, your desires, and your destiny. He's trying to steal your praise, your power, and your promises. But you and I don't serve a devil today. You and I serve a living Savior. We don't serve somebody who takes away. We serve somebody who recompenses back. We serve a God who gives back. Today, the Lord wants to give you grace. He wants to give you His gifts. He wants to give you His glory. We serve a God who gives us His word, His witness and he gives us his wonders we serve a God who gives us strength and salvation and security you are in the right place today the enemy can't take anything from you that God can't give back to you listen you and I need to go and get it and take it back don't let the enemy sell you a bad bill of goods your God is always on your side if God be for you who can be against you come on That's just a warm-up. It's my introduction. I feel like a horse that's getting lathered. But Satan, in spite of all this, still has the nerve and the audacity to try to still steal even the mark that God will one day put on all of our foreheads. A lot of people don't know this, but here's what Revelation 22 says. There shall be no more curse. This is the New Jerusalem. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Let me show you this verse that you all know. The image of the beast, Antichrist, should both speak and cause as many who worship, not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That is not original. It's not new. Satan doesn't come up with it. That's a mark that he's going to take from knowing what God's going to do for you and I. If you and I one day will walk around the new Jerusalem, will walk around eternity with the name of our God stamped in our forehead because you are his possession. You've always been his possession. Listen, when you got saved, you took the, you took the devil's mark off of you and you put the mark of Christ on you and one day you will realize it in your spirit. One day you will stand in all of the glory of God and you will realize that you are a saint called by God that has a divine plan, a royal priesthood, a peculiar generation. And you, my friend, are God's possession. You are not the enemy's possession. You are not the world's possession. You're not your circumstances possession. You were made for God. Somebody asked me this morning if they could get the cliff notes from my message. It's deep, but it's going to come out in a moment. So I want you to see here in our study today, in our message, he steals the story of the stars, especially the meaning of the sign of Aquarius. Now, I know you're thinking, what does Aquarius have to do with, with Christ? Everything. And that's one of the things that bothers me about, about people who don't understand things that are connected. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. The enemy knows it. Okay, let me get technical with you for a moment before I preach. So what about this song from the fifth dimension? Was it just another song of the 60s? Believe it or not, this is the theme song of what we now refer to as the New Age. 
the New Age is something that happened. Listen, it was a, it's a secular religion that focuses on mind power, crystals, feel-goodism. Oh, come on. On meology, based on what, what, hap- what you can get. You see the new moon in Aquarius there. This is the New Age poster. It's about feeling good about yourself because all your stars are lined up. Come on. It's about saying that things are going to go your way. It has to do with transcendental meditation. It brings in all the Eastern religions. And what it does, it takes the story of Christ straight out of the stars and makes it into a Christ-centeredness for one person. When everything revolves around you, you have just lost your Christianity. Are you listening to me? When it's all about you and all about your needs and your, pri- and your priorities and everything is about you, you've missed the message of Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So... What's the lyrics in the song? Listen to what it says. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planet and love will steer the stars. Listen, I was a teenager listening to that. I was probably high when I heard it. Wouldn't matter. I wouldn't have known anything about it anyway. People that hear it today, they don't understand what it's about. But I do understand what it's about because I know the scriptures. How many of you will tell me what this is? What is that? That is our solar system. Now, Again, this is kind of interesting because most people don't have any concept of this, but I want to give you a little teaching today. Not astrology. Astrology is studying your sign in the stars. You don't have a sign. This is all about Christ. Amen. Astronomy is studying those stars. Listen, David said, when I consider the work of thy hands and the firmament, the wonders of the heaven, he thinks, what am I that thou art mindful of me? Let me ask my son to come. Would you be my son today? Bring the rest of your brothers and sisters, if you will. I'm going to give you an illustration today. I went all over Birmingham looking for these articles. People were asking me what I needed them for. I said, come to the healing place. You'll find out. So you might be here. This is my son. Let me just give you a couple facts. Let's come out over here, Pastor. The sun that you take for granted and I take for granted burns every day. It is a thermonuclear ball. It's going through hydrogen and helium, the lightest of elements, and it's a nuclear explosion. It's billions upon billions of nuclear explosions every single moment, right now, every moment. These little pox are the, the, the dips in the valleys of those nuclear explosions. The sun is 960,000 miles across its diameter, almost a million miles. So when you look at that sun out there, it's a million miles. How many of you are seeing the hand of God already? Yeah. Listen, there is no such thing as evolution. Don't believe that junk. That there is, this is an ordered universe, as I'm going to show you in a moment. And so we have this sun 960,000 miles across. In the interior of the sun, it burns at a whopping 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. 27 million. There's nothing we know of like that. Then we have, I'll just do this one for you for a moment. We have planet Earth. I need another volunteer. Youth. That's where you're youth for. To volunteer. Thank you, Mr. Earth. I want you to stand right here. The Earth is an amazing ball. Just face them, if you would. The Earth is an amazing ball. It is 93 million miles from the sun. If I were to take, if I were to reduce the Earth to this size, and you had an image of the Earth against the sun, the sun would fill up from your parking lot there, just, there's just the surface of it, all the way across. That would be a relative size ratio, and the Earth would be this size. So it's an amazing thing, 93 million miles across. The Earth has something, I need another volunteer. Another youth. Just stay right here. You will be our moon today. Come on over here for a moment. All right. The Earth is revolving around the sun. Go ahead and revolve. Uh, (laughs) This boy is a smart boy. If I tell most people they're revolving, they'll go clockwise. But all the planets revolve counterclockwise. Now spin because you're rotating. Ah, you missed it. You got to spin counterclockwise. Come on. Okay, let me blow your mind a little bit more. We are spinning. Are you ready? It takes us 24 hours to make one full rotation. How many of you know that? Good, I can send you home now. All right, and it takes 365 days to go around the sun. This is January 31st. Baby step. Come on. February 1st. February 2nd. All the while spinning in counterclockwise motion. How many are still with me? Did I lose anybody yet? Need some more sugar? <laughs> so they're, they're, it's counterclockwise, okay? Now, as you are spinning around, let me just tell you this. The Earth, the Sun is 960,000 miles in, di- in diameter. The Earth is only 12,000 miles in diameter. 
It's very small. It's a tiny, tiny thing against the sun. It takes us 365 days to get all the way around there. Let me show you the moon. The moon spins around the earth. So I'm going to ask you to spin around the sun, and you spin around the earth as he's going. It's like romper room, doesn't it? Okay, hold on, hold on. Come on over here. I've never had such a good nerve in all my life, trust me. You are also spinning, and you are spinning in what kind of motion? Uh, clockwise. Counterclockwise. Everything that spins is counterclockwise, and you're spinning around. So, it takes you 28 to 30 days to get around here. Actually, it takes you 30 to get around here, okay? Now watch. Blood red moons are not that difficult to imagine because it's a lunar eclipse. When the Earth, come on over on this side, when the Earth gets between the moon and the sun, the rays of the sun come up, the Earth eclipses the moon, the short, ray, the short rays die right here, and the long rays go around us, and you have a red moon. Same reason why you have a red sunset in, in, in the night. A red moon, it diffracts it. Now, that's not an unusual occurrence. That should happen maybe 12 times going around, this, going around once a month. But it is very rare when it happens on Jewish feast days. Only seven times in all, since, since AD 1. The last several times when Israel became a nation, 1948-49. When Israel won Jerusalem, 1967. And now in, in, 19, in 1492 when America was discovered and the Jews were being pushed out of Europe. And now in your lifetime one more time. So, are you ready for some more complexity? How many ready? How many know I have to teach this before we go any further? Okay. Stay there. By the way, you are spinning at 1,062 miles an hour. Okay? And you're traveling around the sun at a whopping 62,327 miles an hour. Don't you feel dizzy already? <laughs> we take this for granted. This is God's handiwork. This was not done by accident. Amen. This is God, okay? So you're spinning. By the way, 62,237 miles an hour is, is a thousand times faster than you'll go home on interstate today. Well, at least some of you. Okay, I need another volunteer. Hello, Mr. Mercury. Hello. You're the closest here. You have a carbon dioxide. Uh, you're actually almost liquid. You have carbon dioxide, and you're rotating around here in, in counterclockwise motion. Go ahead. I have a Venus. I need another volunteer. I've never seen Venus move so slow. <laughs> okay, you are also rotating counterclockwise around there. Earth, you're the third from the sun, you start rotating. Moon, get around him. <laughs> Mars. Uh. Don't, don't cross paths, guys. There you go. Just keep going. Mars, go in there. Okay. You're on the outer edge. Jupiter. Come on, why not? Jupiter. Okay, we're going to round everybody. Just go ahead. Come on. Okay, everybody stop. <laughs> Your turn to participate. Do we have a Virginia in the house? A Leo. All right. You're Virginia. Great. Right in my right spot. Virginia, would you stand up and hold this star? Lee, okay, stand, just stand up if you would for, for me and hold that star, I promise. Would you stand up and hold that star? Stand up and hold that star. Stand up and hold that star. And right over here, stand up and hold this star. You still with me today? I promise you I'm going to preach. This is preaching. Stand up and hold that star. Now watch. How many degrees, this is going to sizzle everybody's math brain. How many degrees are in a circle? Anybody know? 360. Very good. So one circle is 360 degrees. What's one twelfth of that, real quick? 30. This, let's say, is Libra. Libra has stars that are facing us. They never move. These move. Planet, in the Greek, is the word wanderer. They move. These never move. They're always there. This is the story. Are you following it? This is Libra. This is, uh, excuse me, uh, this is Virgo, the virgin. That story's always been there. These planets will go in and out of Virgo in their progression around the sun. We have another one over here. The end of the zodiac or the Maserat, which is Leo. We have a Leo here, Leon, Lynetta, Lynn. 
Here you go. Would you stand up, please? Stand up. Those stars are in fixed in place. So watch what this says. When the moon, there's also one other, let me give you Aquarius right here. So you have 12, how many are following this? All the way around, 12 sections, it's like a pie. How many are following it? Okay, let's do Aquarius. Seventh one from the bottom. Stand up, please. Now watch. Earth, come on over here. With your moon. <laughs> Aquarius is the seventh, seventh constellation from the last one, Leo. When the moon is in the seventh house. And Jupiter, where's Jupiter? Come on over here. Aligns with Mars. Where's Mars? Come on over here. It's right there. Straight line. That's what the dawning of the age of Aquarius supposedly is. Now, there are people, celebrities, kings, queens, they have tried to plot all of this and read their future. That's called astrology. It's demonic. That's right. Okay? That's right. This does have a sign, though. How many understand what I'm saying? There's something to this. And we don't know all of it because it's been warped, but I'm going to show you the age of Aquarius today, what it really was. Would you pass in those? Thank you for Let's give them a hand. You can put all my things down. Those stars. Pastor Leslie, would you get my stars? Okay, so I'm just giving you some illustrations. By the way, this is that Virgo I showed you. One more thing before I preach. Virgo, the virgin. You'll notice Spica is the, is the, is the brightest star you can see. It's, it means the branch. Jesus is the branch. That's the beginning of the Maseroth, if you will. Here's the end. That is Leo the lion. That bright star you see is called Regulus. It means to tread underfoot. How many of you know Jesus is coming back and to tread the enemy underfoot? How many of you know that? So as we see this, many times it gets lost. This is the one we're looking at today. It's Aquarius. That's what it looks like in the night sky. Now, I understand that all of that is a lot of information. I'm not trying to ask you to remember that information. I'm not trying to tell you that I'm preaching from that information. I am starting out with something that the world, secular world, knows that the church doesn't know. So I can tell you that Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle of the word. He fulfilled every single thing you could possibly imagine. All of the creative, creative mind and genius of God, even for him to put those constellations, by the way, they're called houses, even to put them around us, that don't move in your lifetime. Every single one of them is from the creative mind of God that tells a story. Everything is about Jesus. I remember when I was preaching in the, in the church I was at, one of my daughters came up to me and said, Dad, you know, make a relationship. Is everything about Jesus? Every time you talk about something, there's a connection. All, of course everything's about Jesus. Nothing else is about anything else. It's about Jesus. All you got to do is make the connections. Come on, somebody say amen. Whether it's blood red moons or whether it's solar eclipses, we may never know what they fully mean, but I promise you there's something going on. It's God's stopwatch. It's his gears. Those, those stars are the gears of God. He knows exactly what he's doing. Everything's on time. Come on, somebody say amen. He knows everything that's going on, whether it's in your life, my life, whether it's a church life, whether it's, whether it's uh, eternity. He knows it all. It's all under his. You don't have to comprehend it. You don't have to know it. You just got to follow how Jesus progresses through it. Those story in the stars, those 12 things we go through every single month. We are literally going the entire planet. We are going through the story of Christ from his birth to his second coming all the way down. We've been doing it for thousands of years. Nobody's ever told us, but it's been in scripture. The Maseroth is there. God questioned Job. It's always been there. So what is this age of Aquarius? What is the Aquarian? What does it mean? New Agers say it's the dawning of the new age. That's rubbish, by the way. Do you know what this has meant? What it's been depicted as for so many years? That is a water bearer. I showed you the picture. It's somebody pouring out a large jug of water that forms a river. Are you with me today? How many are with me today? How many are not with me today? Well, you're lost somewhere in how far we are from the sun. Forget about it. The water bearer. The one who pours out without measure, and I'm getting ready to preach. It's all about Jesus and what he wants to give us this morning. Now, let me make no mistake about this. Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. I am not living my life by the stars. 
I know it. I have the knowledge of it. I understand it. It confirms my faith because I see Christ in every part of his creation, in God's creation. All things are made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, John chapter 1 tells us. Everything that was made was made with a divine plan. You may not know the full plan of God because you don't know the full mind of God. But I promise you, if you have faith in God, you know that everything he made has a reason. Come on, somebody else. Somebody say, including you and the person next to you. We all have a reason. And God has seemed to make things in orbits. If you look at the micro around us, we'll see, a, we'll see a, an atom. An atom is made up of a, nu of a nucleus, and that nucleus has orbits around it. It has electrons and protons and neutrons. It's all orbiting in counterclockwise motion. Who did that? And, and if, if you need to look at it, you look at it in a microscope, and you can see it's too far away for us to observe from our eyes. If you look at the scars, they're also the sun and the moon and all the planets. They're revolving in a circular motion. That is the, ma that is the macro side. That is the, everything revolving in an orderly fashion in a counterclockwise motion. So everything God has created is revolving. Isn't that amazing? Does that sound like evolution to you? It doesn't to me. And the only thing that's stuck in the middle is you and I. We are not in the infinite and we're not in the infinite small. We're not in the infinite large. We are right here because God is speaking to us. He's telling us something. He's shouting to us from his creation. He wants us to know something. Listen, Peter says you have a more sure word of prophecy. That's your word, the word of God, which I'm about to preach from. And let me tell you something. This will never stop. The word of God will remain. It will go out and it will come back. It will never be destroyed. The enemy can't kill it. It's going to be here forever. The water bearer is Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you about the real age of Aquarius as I preach today. In John chapter 7, the Jews are celebrating a feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of those feasts that we're going to see blood red moons on consecutively in the next two years. In that feast, here's what would happen. The priests are going to go all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. As they go down to the Pool of Siloam in Lower Zion, they're going to get a jug of water out of the Pool of Siloam, the Gihon Spring. They're going to take it up one day, and they're going to pour it on the altar steps in the temple. They're going to do that for seven days consecutively. And then the seventh day, they're going to pour it out seven times. So we know what they're going to do is they're going to be coming up and down, going to that water gate seven times. Now, there's the model of Jerusalem for you. If you want to see what they're doing, this is literal what's happening in Jesus' day in the first century. This is the temple. This temple has the, has the Ark of the Covenant in. The, the priests are going to come down with a huge procession. They're going to march down to Lower Zion. They're going to come to this, which, by the way, has recently been found the last seven years. The Pool of Siloam, hidden for 2,000 years. They're going to get water out of here in jugs, one jug a day. They're going to bring it back up here in a huge procession. Thousands of people are going to come because it's one of the seven major feasts of Israel. People from all over the world, Jews from all over the world in Jesus' day, are traveling to Israel for the Feast of Tabernacles. It, I'll show you what it commemorates and why they're doing it. They will do it the last day. They'll do the seven days. And the last day, they'll go up seven times. Seven times. Last. Jesus is there, but he is not participating in the march. Not until the very last day. The seventh day. By the way, did I tell you last week that the moon is associated with Israel? Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 12. The woman sits, stands with the stars under her and she stands on the moon. Je when you see Joseph's dream, the moon and the 12 stars bowed down to him. Do you think that that's coincidental? No. Even though it talks about his brothers, it's a deeper meaning. It's a deeper, a deeper thought. So we know that Jesus is in the middle of this feast. He's going like a good Jew to that feast. But he has not gone up to the feast. He's waited for seven days. Now, why are they doing this feast? Well, it's a commemoration feast in one hand. And uh, basically, when Jesus goes up, he does something. He cries the seventh day. Jesus goes up and he cries with a loud voice. It says, in the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He gives an invitation. This large crowd that's going up, by the way, are chanting. They're chanting about, they're chanting verses from Joel. They're chanting verses from Isaiah. They're chanting verses from Ezekiel, where there's a promise of the water being poured out. Now I want you to understand the whole significance of it today. Listen to this. It says, um, let me go back here. Afterward, he brought me again to the, oh, let me just back up here. The significance is, is right here. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel, Nerod, wherein thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and when thou shalt smite the rock, there shall come water out of it, the people may drink. The reason they're having the Feast of Tabernacles or booths, it reminds them when the Israelites came out, of, uh, came out of Egypt and they had to live in booths, not houses, and God supplied water. How many of you get it? Okay, so they're commemorating this feast. 
They're showing that God has supplied in the, in the past. They're trying to commemorate the feast. This is a, about the Exodus. So it's a ritual. It's a feast. And so they're doing it even today. During tabernacles, the Jews, even if they live in a million-dollar house, they'll take a little booth outside in their back, and they'll live in the booth for seven days. So it's a feast to commemorate the great provision of God to give water. There was a rock that followed them. That rock gave water. Moses struck it twice, going against God's commandment uh, to strike it only once for water and Moses was pro prohibited from being in the promised land. Why? Because 1 Corinthians tells that rock that followed them was Christ. It was a symbol. Jesus would only be struck once for us, not twice. So Moses ruins the shadow and type. It's so interwoven as you see it. So the seventh day on this feast, they would do it seven times. And now let me continue on. The feast represented several things. Number one, God's past provision of water for them. And the second thing it represented, which you really have to see today, is God's future promise to pour his spirit out in the last days. Let me repeat that. His promise to pour his spirit out in the last days. And Jesus steps out of the crowd on the seventh day. Let me put some flesh to this. He steps out of the crowd, marches up, doesn't say a thing for seven days. Doesn't say a thing for the first six times that they pour the water in the temple step. But on the seventh day, he steps out, and the word cried there in the Greek is this, megaphonos. We get our word megaphone from it. He shouts with a, large, with a loud voice, come unto me and drink. He's, he's yelling to all of, the, all of the, the people that are going there in that, uh, in that celebration. He's saying in that great day, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Can you imagine him on the top of the temple steps? All the priests are doing all of their pageantry and all of their festiv festiv festivities, all of their traditions, and Jesus steps out of the crowd. How many are seeing it? And he says, anyone who's thirsty, come and drink of me. Can you imagine? They wanted to probably string him up right then and there. He's doing something. Why would he do that? Again, that word cried is very emphatic in the original. So what does he mean? What does he do this? This is the sign of Aquarius. Listen to me. He is the water bearer. Jesus was pronouncing a new age. The new age he was giving was the age of living water, where man no more had to go through some festival or some service to go find God, where they can actually come to Jesus Christ. Come on, are you with me today? This is the sign of Aquarius, and it has nothing to do with crystals or mind control or the fifth dimension or what they think the, the, the moon and the planets are aligning. This is an invitation. What Jesus shouts at the top of his lungs, at the top of those steps, at the height of that feast is this, if you are thirsty, then come to me. He he is the real water bearer. I have nothing to give you this morning if you are not thirsty for God. Let me tell you one more time. I have nothing to give you this morning if you are not thirsty for Jehovah. I have nothing to give you this morning if you are not thirsty for Jesus. I have nothing to give you this morning if you are not thirsty for a drink of spiritual water from Jesus Christ. Jesus said the days of all of your feast days mean nothing. I am here to give you the water that people are thirsty for. Come on, are you with me today? A man is crawling through the Sahara Desert when he's approached by another man riding on a camel. As the rider approaches, the crawling man whispers through his parched lips, Water, water, can you please give me some water? I'm sorry, replies the man on the camel, I don't have any water with me. But I'd be delighted to sell you a necktie. Necktie, whispers the man, I want water. They're only $4 a piece. I need water. Okay, okay, two for $7. Please, I need water, the man exclaims. I don't have any water. All I have are ties, replies the salesman, and he heads off into the distance. By now, the man has lost all track of time, crawling through the desert seemingly for days, finally nearing dead, his clothes tattered, his skin peeling out from under his relentless sun. He comes to an oasis with a restaurant. Summoning his last bit of strength, he staggers to the door and confronts the head waiter. Water! Can I get water? The dying man pleads. The waiter says, I'm sorry, sir, neckties are required. <laughs> when you're thirsty, there's not much else you could think about except your next drink of water. You, can't, you don't think about appropriate clothing. When you're thirsty, you can't get it out of your mind. It's all you ever think about. Now, just listen to me today. I want you to understand, Jesus has nothing to offer any single one of us today if we don't have an awareness of our thirst. If you came here because it's your tradition to come to church... And that's it. And you came here because you want to make sure that you want to make sure you want to look at sister so and so and make sure she's here or you want to find out whether you could give your opinion on what color the walls should be. You have missed 
coming to church. You are here because you... Um, listen, Pastor Randy's going to hurt me for this probably, but he probably won't. He'd tell you the same thing. You are here for God. You're not here for me. You're not here for this pastoral staff. You're not here to find out how many pews are here or how many... Or if we don't have pews. You are here for God. Come on. You have to acknowledge your thirst, though. Jesus called to those first century feast goers and to us today to have an awareness of our thirst. Come on, you've figured it out by now, haven't you? There's no lasting earthly satisfaction. Marriage, as good as it is, is not lasting. One of you might die. Family is not lasting. Money is not lasting. Enlightenment is not lasting. Fame isn't lasting. Travel isn't lasting. Athletics isn't lasting. There is no lasting earthly satisfaction. Academic achievement, nothing completely satisfies us. Any satisfaction or significance we gain in our quest fades quickly and becomes a vague memory if remembered at all. Yes, certainly there are happy events along the way. Of course, there's unexpected moments when we experience pure delight, but those moments are fleeting and we can never go back in time to relive them or recapture the sensation when um, why then do we keep seeking for something to satisfy us? We think the next house, the next car, the next big trip, the next amount of money, that will never satisfy what's deep down inside man. But man goes through all of the materialism. They gather everything they can. They show their lapels and they show all of their, all of their products that they only can buy and nobody else can. But the truth is, they're not satisfied either. There is something deep down inside your core, deep down inside your spirit that longs for God. St. Augustine said it in 325 AD. He said every one of us have a God hole. You can stick money in there. You can stick fame in there. You can stick fortune in there but you will never be satisfied with anything. Paul said I've abounded and I've been abased. It didn't matter to him if he had a dollar or a million dollars. It mattered if he had Jesus Christ. It mattered if God was inside him. He was thirsty for God and when you get thirsty for God nothing else matters. I may be preaching to the choir today, but I am going to preach to the choir. Listen to me this morning. Nothing. When, when, why then do we keep seeking for something to satisfy us? Another house, another this. Listen, we occupy, but why do we have to have bigger and better? Simply put, it's because we have to seek. Because we have, you and I are thirsty people. We long for deep satisfaction. We look everywhere we can to get it. We look for the accolades of man. We look for have a big bank account. We, live to, we look to live in a $2 million house. None of that is what I'm talking about today. None of that will satisfy you. Listen, the only satisfaction you will get is if you drink from the river. Are you listening to me? If you recognize your thirst, you need God more than he needs you. You're not doing, I'm not doing God a favor by preaching today. I need God with every bit of my, every ounce of my soul. When, you were, when, the, when the music was playing today, I was crying. I was tearing up. I've heard music before. I, was at my, my, I could feel something in my spirit. I looked at Cheryl. She was crying. Why do we cry? Not because we're wimps. We cry because something is coming out of the innermost being. We're feeling something move in us. We're feeling the power of God because there's nothing else like it. You can go to a concert. It's not going to happen that way. You'll forget about it the week later. But when you go to the house of God and you experience God, oh man, the light switch comes on. Listen, all of us need to feel God in all of his power. Those priests brought water to the temple and they knew a prophecy. See, there was a future prophecy found here in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 47, it says this. Ezekiel has a vision. An angel comes to him by water. Excuse me. He comes to him by the riverbank. He says, and after he brought me again into the door of the house, that's the house of the temple. He shows it, brings him to the temple. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. The front part of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward. And he led me about the way with, unto the utter gate by the way that looks eastward. And behold, there ran waters out of the right side. When the man had the line in his hand, was measuring, went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. And he goes on, and he says this, he says, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through, and the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand. It was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were riven, risen. Waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Ezekiel gets this massive vision. He's by the river. He's by a river, and all of a sudden, he's transported to the temple. He's seeing something pretty amazing. He's seeing a river flowing out of the temple of God, and he sees it flowing out, and an angel starts to measure it. And he says, very close to the temple, the river is a couple inches deep. It's only 
probably to your ankles. Then a little bit further, it's to your knees. Then a little further, it's to your waist. Then finally, it's a river that you can swim in. As it, and this is one of the reasons why those priests of old are starting to pour that water on, not only remembering the Exodus, but w- wanting that future day that's coming, that God will pour out his spirit once again, like Ezekiel is saying. They are going for something. They are asking for something. They are looking for something. Oh, come on. It's a last day's vision of Ezekiel, seeing the water of life flow out of the temple. That temple Jesus was now proclaiming was himself in John chapter 7. Uh, he was, what he was saying was this. You can forget a jug of water and walking all those steps for seven days. You can forget doing it seven times on the seventh day. You can forget your elaborate rituals. You can forget your water is pitiful. Fourteen jugs of water poured out, so what? You will thirst again. But I'm here, he's saying, I'm a fountain flowing to the needy. Oh, come on. I'm a river rushing to the hurting. I am a flood sweeping over mankind. I am the water bearer. If you come to me, you will never thirst again. This morning, Jesus doesn't want you to come here and dip your toes in a few inches of grace. He's not interested in you taking your socks off and dipping your foot in a few millimeters of his power. Man, he doesn't even want you to wade in ankle deep. He wants to inundate your soul today. Inundate it in his love, in his forgiveness, in his peace, in his power, in his anointing, in his healing, in the Holy Ghost. God wants you to jump all the way in. He's here today pouring himself out without measure. The reason I came here today is to tell you that he's never stopped pouring that water out. Come on. He says, whosoever will come, come and drink of the, of the river of life. The next slide says this. Jesus meets a woman at a well. Jesus answered and said to her, let me remind you, this woman has five husbands and she's living with a man. She's an adulteress and she's deep in sin. He never in the beginning con- confronts her sin. He answered and said to her, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. She's at a well. You know why she's at a well? Because that's where you meet men. Women, the word for a woman in there is the word bath. We get our word bath from it. They would go down at 12 o'clock. Was there, it, was the, it was cruising the block. She's unhappy with this fifth, fifth, sixth guy she's with. She's looking for another guy. If you drink this water, you'll thirst again. She's looking for something through sex or through some type of physical relationship. But he said, whosoever drinks of this water that I give, they will never thirst. But the water which I will give him will be a, in, him, in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. She met the seventh man. Come on, are you with me? She met Jesus and Jesus says, I'm going to give you something. You're never going to have this problem again. You're never going to thirst again. Listen, you may be here today and you may be deep in drugs. You may come here because you want to answer. I promise you, God can stop that today. I want you to understand you may be here and you may be hurting physically. You may be seeing separation. I promise you, God wants to give you a water that will make you not thirst again. You don't need drugs. You don't need the alcohol to keep going back to. You don't need something in the world to go back to because you'll just keep going back to it over and over and over and you will never be satisfied. But when you come to Christ, when you drink of the well, when you drink of the water, the river of life, man, nothing else appeals to you. You are satisfied. He is drinking from the fountain that's flowing deep. You still with me today? Jesus is telling them something. They don't get it, by the way. I dare say a lot of people don't get it. Which brings me to the last point today, the promise. In John 7, 38, listen to what he says. Well, I think I have John up here somewhere. Hold on. John 7, 37 is the same one. Let him come unto me and drink. John 7, 38. I don't have it, but I'm going to read it for you. Listen to what it says. After he says that, he says this. He that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your belly and mine. Jesus wasn't interested in a ritual, in processions, in chants. He wasn't trying to explain the stars. He wasn't as interested in you and me today as individuals right now. Matter of fact, if you want to go study the moon and the stars, you maybe want to be careful because the word lunatic comes from somebody who studies the moon. <laughs> Luna. He's interested in you and I as individuals. Now, here's where this message really needs to take root. Scripture is full of his promises to bless us if we drink of his spirit. We see it all over scripture, as a matter of fact. In Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my, my blessing upon your offspring. Listen, Zechariah. 
And it shall be in that day that the living water shall go out of Jerusalem. Let me give you another one. This is in Zechariah. And it shall come to pass last, in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Let me tell you what's happening in the Church of America, all over the Church of America. We are not inviting the Spirit of God in anymore. We don't want to drink. We're afraid of the water. We don't know how to swim anymore. I'm telling you what, there was a day that you, in bygone days when you would go to church and you didn't care what time you got out. You would go to church and you would tarry at the altar. You would go to church and you wouldn't get out of there until you let the Spirit flow over you. There's a time that's coming back again. There was a man here from decades from past uh, Atlanta last week to come hear me because he heard it on the, on the internet. It's not about me. It's because he said, I have gone to a church and the church seems to be Pentecostal, but they never invite the spirit anywhere. They're always doing this and doing that. We understand the mechanics of services. Jesus understood the mechanics of the feast day, but when the feast day and the mechanics of the service take over the Holy Spirit, you have missed something. We are here for the flow of the spirit of almighty God. He's going to heal in this service today. He's going to restore in this service today. He's going to bring back somebody from the abyss in this service today. It's not because of a service. It's because of the flow of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are and I are living in the age of Aquarius in the water bearer where God is pouring out of his spirit upon mankind who is trusting because he's thirsty and without measure. It is not from an earthly Jerusalem that these living waters are flowing, but it's from the dwelling place of Christ himself, which is the consecrated hearts of transformed lives. Now listen real well. When a believer comes to Christ and drinks, he not only slakes his thirst, but receives such an abundant supply that authentic rivers flow out of his inner being. Let me show you something. This is the Dead Sea. The reason it's called the Dead Sea is quite interesting. Hang on there. It is 1236, and I promise you that the Holy Spirit is being poured out here, not on your roast. The Dead Sea is called dead because of this reason. It receives the same water that the Jordan River, that the uh, Sea of Galilee receives. Sea of Galilee to its north, about 200 miles, has many inlets, about seven of them. It's the, where the flow of the Jordan River starts. It goes into the Sea of Galilee teeming with fish. There's fish everywhere in the Sea of Galilee. And it flows out at the southern end and it goes down the River Jordan, which, which makes the, bar the barrier between the nation of Jordan and Israel, and flows into this, the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea, nothing is living. Not one microbe is living. Not one atom is living. Nothing is living in the Dead Sea. Everything is dead. It's salinated. You can't, if you drank that much of it, you would die. It is dead. Why the difference? They have the same river. Now listen well, because this is where I'm going today. I told you all this to tell you this. Because... If all you ever do is receive in and you never give out, you're a dead sea. Most people in churches, all they ever want to do is take in and take in and take in and take in and they never give out. You know, Birmingham in the South was given a test last week. The test was this. Everything stopped, people were stranded. The question was, would somebody want to help someone else? Let me tell you this. Is it convenient? I, we got stuck. I got stuck. I had to ditch my car. I had to walk my pregnant daughter and my wife over a mountain to get to our house. We did it. When I came up to the one road, it went straight up. It looked like somebody had a jigsaw puzzle and just took cars and trucks and just threw them in there. They were everywhere. We came up. Everybody was stranded. They were spinning. They were coming off the mountain. We were, I was afraid they were going to hit some, one of us. As we walked up the mountain, I looked into one of these cars, and I saw, and you know, the interesting thing to me was the cars I saw stuck the most were BMWs and Mercedes. They are dogs in the snow. <laughs> and everybody was reduced. Whether you had a Kia or a BMW or a Mercedes, you were all reduced to the same level. Yeah. And I looked into that car window and I saw a lady reading her Bible. So I looked at her and I knocked on her door and I said, have you been stuck? She said, I've been here three hours. She was not getting out of there, trust me, for a long time. I said, why don't you come home with me? So she came home with us. We fed her three square meals, maybe four. We gave her a room to sleep. She was comfortable. As a matter of fact, she said, man, this is like a hotel. I was saying, oh, no. <laughs> why, did I do, why did we do that? Because God has freely given to us. 
we must freely give to others. There was a test. Even the unsaved were opening up their houses. And what were they doing on 280? They were giving bottles of water because people couldn't get to water. You know what happens? Deep down inside of every human being, we have this desire to give out. But you, if you give it out in your name, forget it. It's not accounted to you. But if you give a cup of water in Jesus' name, it'll be remembered. This is what it's about. It's about giving, not receiving. It's about giving out. The iconic words of, of a President John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address in the 60s said this, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'd like to put that in modern terms to a church. Ask not what your church can do for you. Amen. Ask what you can do for your church. Or how about this, ask not what people can do for you, ask what you can do for people. Because Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You have received the water. Now give. Let me tell you why we gave to that lady. Because I know the living, giving water of Christ. I want to continue to flow in it. I want to be alive in him. I don't want to be a dead Christian somewhere listening to all kinds of messages and taking things in, taking one sermon in and another sermon in, listening to a Christian broadcast, listening to some Christian music, and all I ever do is take in and take in and take in. No, I want to give out. I want to pour out. It's the reason that I'm a Christian today because it's the only thing I find on this planet that is selfless. You give out and bam, when you give out, out of your belly, God flows right back in. As soon as you give out, he flows right back in. We live by faith. No one signs a paycheck for us. But I'm going to tell you, I have never, I have never had a need since I've been living by faith. I've never had a lead. You know why? Because every time we give out, God gives back in. It is a rule. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. I'm closing today, trust me. It's not from an earthly Jerusalem. Listen, this law of nature and spiritual nature may also be applied to the child of God. And it explains why so many believers, as I said, are unfruitful. They lack spiritual vitality. Because it's possible for some people to attend church, to listen to sermons, to listen to what the, to continually take in the words, even study scripture, continue to take in the word that is preached from the pulpit, and yet seem lifeless and unproductive in their Christian lives. Such individuals are like the Dead Sea. They have several inlets, but no outlets. outlets. To be vibrant and useful believers, we must not only take in all we can, we must give out to others. Let me point somebody out for you tonight, today that the Spirit just kind of lit, just kind of alerted me to. Ron, stand up. Stand up, Ron. Ron, stand up. Where's Ron? Is Ron here today? Oh, he's in the first service. Let me tell you about, there's a guy in the first service that's, uh, that's a regular member of this church, Ron Hall. How many know who he is? Ron Hall and I share something. We have the same grandchildren. He is the father of my son's wife. Ron has cancer. Every single time I've seen Ron, it's not about him. It's always a smile. It's always, isn't it, Cheryl? Always loving somebody else. Let me show you another guy. He is here. Stanley, stand up. My nephew, he has cerebral palsy. I have never heard him complain about one single thing, yet we have to take him his meals. We have to do things for him that he can't do for himself. He's dependent on it. I've never heard him complain about a thing. There are many of you here today, you understand that a light switch goes on when you get saved. When that light switch goes on, here's what it means. It means, God, you've done so much for me. And it doesn't take money. Money is the cheapest thing you can give to somebody. It takes your time and your love and a smile and a hug. The things that come from deep inside you. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Man, if we, if we all did that, this world wouldn't have a chance. They'd all get saved. Now, just follow me as I close this morning. I know I said it, this is the third time. And... At the sake of not being a liar, I'm going to have to close. Just listen. When you really know Christ, you become desirous of one thing and one thing only. More. More, more, more. Whether we realize it or not, our souls are thirsting for God. Every desire, every aspiration, every longing of our nature is nothing less than a yearning for God. We were born for his love and we cannot truly live without him. He is the joy for which we have been searching for all of our lives. Everything that we desire is found in him and infinitely more. Jesus is the answer for this deep thirst. But it's our responsibility, our opportunity to drink deeply of him, to trust him to produce the kind of change way down deep inside of us we know that we need. 
And so if you find yourself restless and thirsting for something more in life, then you're going to have a moment right now to respond to Jesus, to the invitation, come to me and drink. Sure, would you give me a, one of those bottles of water? Today, anyone can come. It doesn't matter what sin you have. It doesn't matter what you find yourself in. It doesn't matter a single thing that you're going through today. Anyone can come. You can come and drink freely, he said. By the way, let's say that right now you had a $100 bill in your pocket. And I asked you to give it to me for, the, for, this glass of for this bottle of water. You'd probably say I was crazy. Or at least wonder what was so special about it. But let's change the scenario a little bit. Imagine that you've been walking for days and days in the burning desert. With your mouth dry, needing water. Then you suddenly saw me standing in front of you with this bottle of water. Let me tell you something. All of a sudden everything changes. You would give me every single thing you have for one more drink. Is that the way we came to church today? I need Jesus more than I need anything else right now. I need to feel him, to experience him, to drink of him one more time. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment today? It's been a privilege to be here in your church. I am truly impressed with this church. I love the hearts that I see. Let me show you two slides. I asked you to bow your heads. Just look up for a moment. Let me show you two slides. This one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the lighting down of tongues. He said, go and wait for the promise of the Father he says, I will pour out my spirit without measure on your sons and your daughters. This wasn't for 2,000 years ago. This is for anybody who's willing. And I don't want to get into any theology with you today, but we need more of the spirit than we need more of anything else today. Somebody say amen. And Jesus offers this. With open arms and open hands, he gives us this. The water. The water of life. You know, it's interesting. When I go to Israel, um, I go to different cities in Israel or someplace, and every city I go to, all I have to do is look around and I'll find a water somewhere. These are ancient cities. These, are, these aren't like New York City and they're only two, three hundred years old. These are cities that are thousands of years old. And let me tell you what they, how they built cities then. They found the sources of water and they built their cities by their water because their water sustained their life. If they didn't have water, they didn't have any life. Boy, wouldn't that be great, Brother Gerald, if the church just sustained itself by being close to Christ all the time? building our household there, building our family there, building all of our dreams Amen. and our desires there. Just saying, God, I want to stay by the river. I want to flow in the river, God. Let me tell you something. I have preached more services than I could possibly imagine. I've been in church more than I could possibly. I don't need, an, I need another church service like I need a hole in the head. What I need is to get by the river. That's what I want. Today, you should bow your heads with me for a moment. I love this church. I love your pastor. I love your staff. I see the glow of the Lord. Oh, we're all humans. We all have our moments, but uh, I see the glow of the Lord. I see the power of God. I see a flowing every time I come in here. I see it on faces. I went to the, to the sound booth this morning before I came in. All the guys were just glowing. They were just like, I'm sure we all have our problems, but all those guys were just, hey, Pastor Mark, Brother Mark, and I could see the, they were so eager to do service, and I saw the river flowing. I looked at them, I saw the, I saw the abundance river. Now, there are some of you here today, you're dry. You're thirsty. Maybe you've never experienced that river. We're not judging you. We're just saying, come on and drink. Come on and drink. Man, I've been drinking this year, river for decades. It has never, ever let me down. This morning, if you're here and you don't know Christ, maybe you're unsaved. Maybe you came because somebody invited you. I'm an evangelist above anything, and here's my question to you today. Are you going to continue to go through life, trying one thing after another and never being satisfied? Or when the free river is flowing, would you make a decision? I'm going to ask you to do anything other than make a decision today. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Way in the back. And another one over here. Maybe you're saved. Maybe, and I, again, no theology today. Maybe you're saved, but you've not tasted from the river for a long time. Some people call that backsliding. Some people call that just having a fresh drink. Maybe you're just, something's missing. But you know what you're missing and you want to come back, and you're saying, man, I want to rededicate myself to God today. All you're saying is, I want to come back up to the river and drink it again. Would you raise your hand? Say, that's me here and here and here and here and here and here, here, all over this place. Now, Christians, listen to me. Where would we be without the water of life? Let me tell you something. Life is tough. You get old. You die. Life is hard. Even if you're young, there's disappointments that come. There's nothing that, there's no such thing as a, a fairy tale life. There's no such thing. You have the great moments, thank God for them. They're only offset by the terrible moments sometimes that we all have to go through. But I know this, there's nothing terrible about that one that's marching across the sky. There's nothing terrible about the Redeemer who was born of a virgin that's coming back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. 
There's nothing terrible about a mark that he's gonna stamp in my forehead one day and say, come on, come on in brother, well done. There's nothing terrible about a new Jerusalem and a, and a mansion. There's nothing terrible about, the, about God that we serve. It's interesting, I don't have time to give it to you today, but in Judges chapter five, when Sisera is coming to destroy Israel, the Bible says that the stars sang together and helped Israel and the ancient river showed up. Man, I don't know if anybody wants to take that apart or not, but it, God's showing it all through scripture. I have a call. I have a river. If you've, I'm going to ask us all to stand this morning for a moment. Listen, if you have a need today, maybe it's a health need. I sense today that there are some here that you've gone through some really depressing times. I'm telling you, the river will help you. I sense here that maybe there's some that have a health need. Let me tell you something, God can take care of that health need. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're watching things erode around you. Listen, the river never stops. It doesn't dam up. It's always there, and someone's pouring it out. He's been showing it in the stars since day one. I'm pouring out the river. This morning, if it's you, if you raised your hand for any reason, or maybe deep inside, all you want is more of God. That's all I'm asking you to come up here for, more of God. Man, I would run up to this altar. If it's you today, come up as we sing this. We're going to sing unto the Lord today. If you want more of God, more of His Spirit, more of the flowing in your life, those of you who are wanting to rededicate your hearts to the Lord, those of you who are wanting to be saved, Come up right now. Come on, there's more of you. All I'm asking you is to have more of God. That's all. Every one of us. Make your way up here. I want more of God's blessing. I want more of God's power. I want more of that spiritual drink. I want more. We should be draining these altars today. Coming up. Let's sing it as you come. River flow. River flow. to God's altar today. He's pouring out from the altar. one more call I know it's late but I'm gonna ask everyone here to come closer and let me tell you something how how fall, false religions show us up so many times today in India in the Ganges River worshipers of a false God are going down and cleansing themselves in the river monks are dri dipping themselves in the river they're washing their clothes in that river it's a nasty river they are drinking their water from that river they're taking their dead and they are burying them in that river, believing that the ancient Ganges River will have some type of healing power. Listen to the faith of people who are non-believers. Today, here's what I'm asking. I'm asking every single person in this place, everyone, to come out of your seat and take a step towards this river. That's all I'm asking you to do. We'll be closing soon. I wanna pray as a group today. I'm gonna to ask you all to come forward. The river of God never stops flowing. Listen, the world's gonna flow all kinds of junk down your river. God will never flow any drunk down your river. Yes. He's going to flow salvation, yes. healing, power, yes. joy, long-suffering. He's going to flow all of the things and the attributes of God. You get in God's river, and man, it changes you. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I know we're crowding it all together, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to sing this one more time. And as we sing it, let me remind you that the person next to you is going down that same river right now. They are your fellow travelers. Strangers and pilgrims on this earth, but man, we got a river whereof the streams will make us glad. One day, read Revelation, in the New Jerusalem, there will be a river flowing out of the middle of the throne, and it'll come out. That river is already flowing through Jesus Christ. Let's sing it one more time to him. Raise your hands and sing it with him. Make an offering to him today. Say I can't. 
can see again. Let the deaf man say, I am born again. Let the river flow. Oh, let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Before I dismiss you, let me tell you something. Jennifer, your days of waiting are over. God is restoring something to you right now, and I want you to know it. There's a woman right back here. I'm not going to point you out, but I can see the depression all over your face. And let me tell you something. God can instantly take you out of that depression. He's going to do that today. There's a healing going on in the body of a man right over here. I don't know what it is, but there's a healing going on right now in your body. God can point every single one of us out. It's not a parlor trick. Every one of us. He knows every single one of us. He need, knows our need. And you took a step to the river. It's always been flowing. It's, he answers you because you took a step. That's why I called you up. This morning, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray this. I'm going to pray that the enemy does not steal this message from your ears. I'm going to pray this week you see the river all around you. Every place you go, it flows. I get chills just thinking about it. That the Holy Spirit moves on you. And you realize you are in a living, vibrant creature in the living river of God. This morning, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray a blessing upon you. Let's all bow. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your anointing, oh God, for your flow, Lord God. I thank you we're not here just doing another service. Lord, we don't need that. We need to experience you, Lord God. I'm thankful that there are people willing to jump into the river of your grace and your blessings and your power. And Lord, I pray today that you bless them. Bless their going in and their coming out. They're rising up and they're setting down. Lord, let them know that they are the head and not the tail, oh God. Let them know that we will bruise Satan under our feet shortly. And Lord God, let us be strong and victorious, knowing that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that you are with us every moment of our day. And Lord, above all, let us swim in your river this week. Lord, I pray that this message stays in our hearts and our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand today. God bless you.